ओके सो हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम बैक टू दी पी एम एफ आई एस करंट अफेयर टेस्ट सीरीज दिस इज आशीष मलिक एंड वी आर हेयर टू डिस्कस द नेक्स्ट सेट ऑफ द क्वेश्चन विच इज फ्रॉम सिक्सटी वन टू एटी अबाउट द सेकेंड टेस्ट विच वॉज कंडक्टेड ऑन फिफ्टींथ ऑफ द फेबररी आई होप यू हैव एंजॉयड द फर्स्ट थ्री पार्ट एंड इवन दिस पार्ट इज गोइंग टू बी वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फ्रॉम द यू पी एस सी पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू एवरी क्वेश्चन इज अट मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट हाउ वी शुड अप्रोच इट वट यू शुड बी taking care of about uh, uh, you know attempting these questions we'll see into these next set of the questions okay so let us get started uh, the question number 61 which was there so this uh, question 61 was with respect to the renaming of the state and renaming of the districts it's a very uh, core topic very basic topic of of indian polity and governance so it is about when you have to rename a state or a creation or renaming a district okay so how the procedure works and that was the case now there are few things that you should be uh, that you should know before you attempt this particular question like for example uh, whenever there uh, in india uh, we have a, a constitutional process so whenever you have to rename a state you need to have the provisions from article 3 article 4 and whenever the renaming is to be done it is always to be done uh, by a constitutional amendment that is very much required but how that proceeds so the the whenever there uh, any state needs to be renamed first a bill has to be introduced okay and that needs to be introduced right in the parliament that particular bill always need a recommendation from the president before it is introduced and before the introduction of that bill the president also send that bill to the state assembly because ultimately their state's name is going to get changed so obviously the state the views from the state government also taken into account but whatever the views are they are not binding ultimately they are sent for the consent but they are not binding on the government so finally after that those views are taken by the president then president recommends the parliament okay you go and introduce that particular bill and once that bill is introduced in the parliament for the purpose of deliberation then the bill has to be passed by simple majority so clearly while naming renaming a state the state assembly does not have any real power the state has no real power in that particular case okay it it's just a kind of formality which is taken into account but when it comes to the renaming of the districts now district is something which is more intact and which is more under the control of a state now while while you if you want to create a new district or you want to rename and alter or do anything of that then the real power lies with the state government with respect to creating altering and abolishing the district and they the state government can do it very simply by uh, by by passing an executive order or they may they can also pass a law with respect to that in the state assembly and the things can be done what about the central government role in terms of the new district see the central government does not play any role in terms of creating and altering the districts but 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 there is a star mark point if you are going to rename the districts if the the question is about changing the name of a district then definitely home ministry has a role to play because ultimately you have to convey to the home ministry that we are changing the name of the district plus you also have to take the no objection certificate from from the railway ministry or something because ultimately the the railway ministry also needs to change the name of that particular districts because uh, it 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 is a part of lot of railway routes so in that particular case home ministry and railway railway ministry of course they have a role to play but only in the case of naming the renaming a district but you have to create alter abolish in that it is all up to uh, it is all uh, uh, you know based on the state government that is all now if you if you have understood these two concepts and then you look at the question you will see it's a very simple question now renaming of the state require amendment by simple majority yes because ultimately the renaming and all it is not done under article 368 because article 368 is more complex procedure it is the renaming of the state can be done by simple majority that is all okay and similarly whenever you have to create a new district district uh, the state government and central uh, it is all done by state government and central has no role to play except uh, providing the clearance for the names but very careful if the question specifically talk about renaming a district then central government has some role to play here the answer is c both are correct very easy 
I mean, even with the common sense, you can uh, you can understand which because ultimately which particular government has a role to play in which particular domain that can be done. So definitely something that you should attempt. Uh, the next question that was there in, in your test number two, the question number 62 was with respect to Guru Ravidas, very, very important figure in the history of India, especially when you talk about the art and culture part, when you talk about the Bhakti movement, Guru Ravidas is something that you should always be studying. Like you have Guru uh, Kabir Das and there are other so many uh, important figures of the Bhakti time movement, so is the Guru Ravidas. Now, before you attempt it, there are certain, again, certain important things that you should be aware of Guru Ravidas. Now, uh, Guru Ravidas belonged to North India and uh, he was born here. He was North Indian mystic points, uh, poet, saint and he was very, very active during the Bhakti movement, very landmark watershed movement of Indian history where uh, you see kind of spiritual reawakening was happening uh, in the Bhakti movement in India. Very, very important watershed movement, Bhakti movement. Uh, it, this is something you should always read when, while you are doing, while you are reading the medieval history. It is an important part to read. Now you see in Bhakti movement also there were two uh, factions. Some people were uh, were going for the Sagun Bhakti. Sagun Bhakti means when you are when you are worshiping the God in some in some form, in some divine form, in in the form of a figure that is Sagun, where you have a face of the God. Other section was the Nirgun Bhakti, which is the formless worship. Now, Guru Ravidas belonged to that Nirgun Bhakti, the formless worship and he was also the founder of a kind of new religion that was emerging in the North India at that time, which is called the Ravi Dasya religion. The name has a meaning, right? And he was so impactful that time that his verses were also included in Guru Granth Sahib, which is the, which is the ultimate Sikh uh, scripture that we have. Guru Ravidas started and he, he imagined a, a society which is stateless, classless and casteless society and he named that concept as a Begampura. Begam, gum is Dukh, sorrow, right? So Begampur is basically land without sorrow. He wanted to create a society without where everyone lives in harmony and there is absolutely nobody living with the sorrow. This was his idea and that is, that is how he, he was talking about, he was delivering his uh, preachings to the people that you should try to create something like that. In fact, Begampura concept is very important in our medieval history because it is considered to be one of the earliest visions of the anarchist utopia in Indian literature. In later times, you, you have heard of the term utopia, which is everyone, everyone is happy, uh, everyone is so, uh, you know, lively and happy in that place. But Begampura is something which was the base of the concept of utopia, which even the Western people use. Now, very important, uh, and yeah, I told you about the Sagun Nirgun Bhakti, that is important. Plus, Ravidas is something to be remembered because he, he criticized the caste system. He was against the caste system. He openly criticized the practices of untouchability. That is why even today, the people from, from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribal groups, they are even bigger followers of Guru Ravidas. Even today, we celebrate uh, Ravidas Jayanti and uh, people, especially the people of these particular castes, they still uh, worship him like a god. Okay, so that is important because he actually talked about how casteism should not be there in Hindu religion, and he was the he was a, a champion of uh, you know of this particular cause. Now, if you look at the question, yes, the first statement looks quite quite good. It's a fact-based question. He belonged to Bhakti movement and he started this particular religion. His society called Begampur is absolutely correct. The name itself says a lot. But look at the third statement. Now, this is something you cannot predict. You, you have to be good with the information. Like, like I told you, always try to remember the famous people of the Bhakti movement and who was with which particular section. Guru Ravidas was not Sagun uh, uh, Sampradaya. He was with the Nirgun Sampradaya, which is formless worship of the God. So, third is incorrect. I think this is also a very easy question, something that you should attempt. But of course, you should you need to have a, have an information about Guru Ravidas and always try to prepare the topics of Bhakti movement and Sufism. They are very important topics when it comes to the medieval history of India. The next question is something that you can you can solve with a bit of common sense and logic. The question is about which particular satellite communication uh, uh, is developed by ISRO and it is specifically to be utilized for the, for the fisherman. Okay. Now the key word here is the fisherman. 
because you see all of them all of them are made by isro all these satellite system navik bhuvan gagan nab mitra but which specifically is for the welfare for the benefit of the fishermen of the country now you see navik is something we already have understood navik is the navigation with indian satellite now navik is navik is uh, something which is about regional which we call as indian regional navigation satellite system so it has to do with something bigger of the navigation purpose and this is something which which we are considering as a replacement of gps so navik is not going to focus dedicatedly on the fishermen it's a broad navigation system that we are talking about so clearly this cannot be the case you can rule out what about the bhuvan and the gagan so bhuvan is basically a geospatial uh, platform of india and uh, uh, that that also is not about the fishermen gagan is more talking about the civil aviation it is more concerned for the civil aviation as the name says gagan gagan means sky right now the only option logical option that i am left with is nabamitra maybe i am not aware of the answer but at least i have eliminated the other three now only option left with is nabamitra it was a bit medium but i would definitely recommend you to uh, attempt it you you just have to eliminate because other three other three are really very famous uh, satellite communications of isro and i expect you guys to know about these at least these three now giving you a bit more information navik is something we already have explained you in the previous uh, previous video also uh, navik is about this particular now talking about the nab mitra first which is about helping the fishermen so isro developed the satellite communication nab mitra uh, nab mitra is dedicatedly for the fishermen it's a two way messaging services where fishermen can communicate with the shore authorities uh, fishermen will receive information with respect to the weather the cyclone maritime boundaries so it's a very important uh, satellite communication which actually help the fishermen specifically in terms of any emergency disaster where fishermen can communicate with the authorities and they get the benefit and the best part is they get all the information in the local languages that make this particular app even more inclusive and helpful for all the community people right uh, navik i told you is about the navigation uh, system and uh, uh, bhuvan is national geo portal which is basically for uh, uh, you know a portal that that take care of the geospatial data services tools and all more mainly for the analysis purposes gagan is gps aided geo augmented navigation which is a collaborative effort by the isro and airport authority of india and that makes it very obvious that this is going to talk about the navigational services with respect to the civil aviation of india because airport authority of india is involved in this purpose so it is primarily designed for aviation not for the fishermen that is also very obvious here now that takes us to the question number 65 64 Question sixty four is talking about a very mysterious illness that affected U.S. intelligence embassy people, and the key word, very important word, is this illness was mainly caused by high frequency microwaves. Please, this is your key word, and uh, focus on that. These high frequency microwaves that actually damage the nervous system. I think you see you have you have the four diseases. I I understand it's a it's a tough question. because uh, you can you have no scope of doing any logic or something but the answer is very famous it's a very very famous disease called havana syndrome because havana syndrome is something which was in the news in 1960s or something especially those uh, american scientists which were placed in cuba and they experienced these high frequency microwaves and they had lots of headache a lot of drowsiness and they were having lot of problem with respect to the nervous system because it is so famous that is why the question i think is something that you should be aware of it it it, it is for many people it's a tough one i know if you have no idea if you have absolutely no clue there is no scope of risking it please then skip because because this is something you cannot you are not very sure and you can't get by by, by the by the guess work right but havana syndrome i expect you guys to know because it's a very very famous uh, a uh, disease which was there havana syndrome and it is something which which is uh, causing the nervous system damage all because of the high frequency uh, microwaves of course as of now even till date there is no definitive cause that how microwaves are responsible for that that situation we do not have any scientific proof of that but many scientific studies has hinted 
it is because of these high frequency microwaves and there are some acute symptoms there are chronic symptoms people have uh, felt headache insomnia depression imp impaired balance lot of lot of people even experience the memory loss it's a very scary situation for those people who experience it well if you talk about the other uh, diseases of course they are also something you have to be very specific about like for example we have the als disease als is also nervous system disease but it has nothing to do with the microwaves als is talking about nervous system where 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 it's a situation where the person lose control over the muscles and because of the because of the poor functioning of the brain and the spinal cord uh, you have this problem but it is it is not associated with the fre high frequency microwaves similarly we have the lyme disease it is a bacterial infection which is transmitted by the ticks the marburg virus disease that we are talking about it is also very fatal disease but it also it is not about the high frequency waves so yes i i know the answer because it's a famous disease otherwise it's, it's a tricky question now question number 65 was with respect to somatic mutations now if you know because this is a hardcore topic of bio science and tech if you have no idea about somatic mutation the things become really tough somatic mutations what are these somatic mutations first you need to know about them you need you should have a basic idea so first let me give you a clear definition what exactly somatic new mutations are somatic mutations are basically the changes in the dna sequence of the non reproductive cells in our body we have some cells which are used for reproduction function some cells are non reproductive cells for example my skin my muscle my blood cells they have nothing to do with the reproduction system right so skin muscle and blood cells they are all called the non reproductive cells this somatic mutation is specifically going to change the dna sequence of my non reproductive cells that is one thing but since the somatic mutation is about the non reproductive cells definitely it is not going to get transmitted to my offspring to the baby that we are going to produce because because somatic mutation is not going to impact the reproductive cells so by default the infection is not going to transfer to the offsprings and specifically if if a person is reproducing sexually but there is one exception because there are some organisms you have read in your in, in your in your bio, uh, uh, in your uh, biology there are some organisms they actually reproduce asexually right or some uh, some organisms they do not have a dedicated germ line in that particular case even even the offspring is going to suffer this uh, somatic mutation but majority cases the sexual reproduction cases there is no transfer of the somatic to the new one okay important and the and the other statement which again is talking about the same thing because since they are uh, impacting non reproductive cells they are not going to get transmitted now if you look at the statement if now if you know the now i have told you the concept of the of the somatic mutation now please read the statement the first statement says it uh, they are not inherited by the offspring uh, unless organism reproduces asexually does not have a germline absolutely correct and the second statement says somatic occur in non reproductive cells and can affect the function appearance of the cells but not passed into the offspring so clearly the both statements are correct and two is explaining the first correctly the answer has to be a i mean this particular question i would say it's a tough one because the somatic mutation is not something which we which we talk very often it, it was a tough one you can risk it you you can risk it because by reading the two statements you have a bit of the idea if you are absolutely no not aware about somatic mutation or you are not aware about about reproductive non reproductive cells then it is something you should not be uh, uh, you know because it it's it's a tough combination of figuring out the two and then uh, you know giving this kind of answer is a bit tough one question 66 is i would say it is more of a common sense we all have heard of the andes mountains right you you think of south america you think of the andes mountain right now very even if i if i make a very layman diagram of south america i know now this is somewhere because i have seen it so many times on the map we know that okay the andes mountain lies to the western side to the western side of the south america right at least you have this much information the question is asking you which countries andes mountain extend okay now at least if you if you have seen the map of south america twice or thrice you must be having the idea about the location of the countries since the andes are here 
at least I can eliminate any country which is going to be extreme east side. Okay, I need to be concentrated on the countries which are more of a western side. I do not know the right answer, but at least I can eliminate. Please attempt this question by elimination method. Look, the countries where Andes mountains extend, can the country be Panama? Absolutely not. Panama is not South America. Panama is in Central America. So Panama is not where the, the Andes mountains are extended. So I can eliminate that. Similarly, you look at the countries of Guana, Suriname. Well, these particular countries, they lie more of the eastern side. If you, if you know the map, I'll show you. Don't worry about that. So clearly, they, are not, they cannot be the answer. Right. And similarly, if you look at, look at the option number B. Okay. Now look at these countries, particular these country of Paraguay and Uruguay. Now, both these countries are also lying on the eastern side of South America. So, clearly I can eliminate it. Now, the only option I am left with is the first one. Even I'm, if I am not sure if all these countries are there, but at least I know the other options are not correct. So, by default, my answer has to be A in this particular case, right? So, I think, I think this is a medium kind of question, but you must attempt it by going with the logic. By going with the position of all you need to know is the Andes and little bit map of South America. Look here. So this is this particularly is the map of South America. And here you have the Andes mountain. Look at the because they are extremely, extremely on the western side. Since they are extreme on the western side. So clearly the country like Paraguay, the country like Uruguay, all these country of Guana, Suriname, they cannot be the answer. Look at the Panama. Panama is even quite away. It was in Central America. So by eliminating method, I've got the right answer in this particular case. Sometimes you do not know to, you are not expected to know the answer, but sometimes you are expected to, to figure out which is definitely not the answer. So elimination method comes into play in that particular case. Next question is with reference to the delimitation commission. Very important question and you, are, you have to figure out which statement is correct. Now why delimitation commission? Because first understand the context in these particular days. You know that 2021 census is still pending and, and you know that India is going to have the next delimitation commission in 2026. So for the next two years or something, delimitation is something you always have into the news. So you need to know some basic facts about delimitation commission. It is very, very important for, for, for a country like India where democracy and electoral process is something the core of our, uh, of our uh, functioning on a day to day basis. Okay. Now, what is delimitation? First of all, the, the meaning of delimitation is like, like when we decide, okay, uh, this is the, the, this is the whole population of a, of a place. Now the end, this entire population, how many number of Lok Sabha seats has to be there? Like we, we calculate it with per person. Okay. Uh, per 10 lakh people or per 1 lakh people, how many number of representatives has to be there? And delimitation is also about the, it is also ab about drawing the boundaries of, of the constituencies. Like for example, in Lok Sabha in Haryana, if I, if I tell you, so Lok Sabha, uh, there are 10 seats of Lok Sabha in Haryana, or there are 90 seats of Lok Sabha uh, in, uh, in the Vidhan Sabha. So how many number of seats, which particular constituency is going to have, which, how much particular area, this whole process is called delimitation. Delimitation is done for the purpose of elections in our country. The whole exercise of delimitation is carried out by an independent commission called delimitation commission. And for that matter, for that purpose, the whole method, the whole uh, procedure of delimitation is under the provision of delimitation commission act, which was set up by the parliament only, only and only parliament can set up the delimitation commission. You see, because it is talking about the electoral process. So of course, you see, look at the center and the, and the state. The center is obviously going to have more control over the electoral process. Under the article 82, the parliament is there and parliament has the power to, to uh, enact, establish a delimitation commission. Now delimitation commission from the, from the central government side, it is actually appointed by the president of India. And then it works in collaboration with election commission of India. And then uh, you, you know, uh, the whole process is carried out. Now be very careful in delimitation commission. It is composed of a retired Supreme Court judge, a chief election commissioner of India and 
representative state election commissioner as well. This is the composition. You never know. This composition is important. You never know the question may ask you about the composition also. And this delimitation commission, guys, let me tell you, it is a very, very powerful, uh, uh, very, very powerful commission. The decisions taken by this uh, commission, they are final. They cannot, even you can't go to the court. Even Supreme Court and High Court also, they cannot intervene. Every decision by delimitation commission is, is final. It's a very powerful commission. And very importantly, uh, while talking about, while deciding the constituency size, the boundaries, number of seat, delimitation commission has one more task of identifying the seats which needs to be reserved for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. So at a national level and at a state level also, SC, ST seats are reserved and they are also done by the delimitation commission. Of course, depending on the size of the tribal population or SC population of that particular area to give them more representation for obvious reasons, right? Now, very interestingly, look at, look at the way normally in under article 82, it, it was said that after every census, there has to be delimitation commission. And for that matter, initially India had delimitation commission in, uh, uh, in, in uh, year 51, 61, 71. India had after every census. But after 1971, some stop was, uh, some stop was put on the, on the delimitation commission because that time, that time the population control was a big agenda with the, with the government. Because you see population control, because in India, 1971, onwards between 1971 and 1981 India experienced a population explosion why population explosion because that particular decade Indian population grew by a rate of 24 percent rise in Indian population so obviously after 71 the government of India was talking about controlling the population and for that matter it was decided that okay now let's put a cap on the number of seats because a lot of people were talking about this that you know the the every state which is which is now producing more population is going to give get more representation in the politics so for to to uh, you know to disincentivize these kind of things it was decided that 1971 census is to be uh, is to be considered for for uh, uh, what you say for for the purpose of a number of seats so that the states can focus and they, they are not incentivized to increase their population just for the sake of political representation. And, and the same thing was also carried out. Now, uh, this was done till 1996. 1996, another commission, uh, uh, another inquiry was made. And now that, but till 2026, till 2026, 1971 census is going to be fixed one. But for uh, one very important example, uh, uh, for the purpose of, uh, uh, you know, more representation, 2001 census is taken into account, especially when you have to, when you have to talk about the ST and ST population. For, for the representation of SC and ST population, 2001 census is going to be taken it into account, not 71, but that also without altering the number of seats, because number of seats are seized. They are freezed till 2026 for that matter, right? That is important. Now, if you, if you look at, the question once again. What was the question about delimitation? Look at the question once again. Now the question said, delim lead, uh, delimitation commission set up by act of parliament only, though 95% cases only is wrong. But here I would say it's a, it, it, this is an exception and this is actually correct because parliament only has the uh, uh, power of delim delimitation commission because it's a matter of national importance. That is why it is obvious. And delim delimitation commission going to uh, reserve the seat for SCST. Yes, that is important. Now look at the third statement very carefully. Total number of the seat in assembly and parliament determined on based on 2001 census. No, they are not. I just told you that the number of seats are still going to be considered 1971. The population is the problem I told you about the anti-natalism program which was going on in India at that particular time. 1971, but but again this is till 2026 only. Then any then there is there is uh, what what we have said there is written that any any census after 2026 is going to be taken into account for deciding the number of seats. Probably some people are saying that is why the government is delaying 2021 census and maybe this census is going to carried after 2026 so that so that this uh, uh, based on this census only you are going to see more Lok Sabha seat, more Rajya Sabha seats and lot more things will come up. So third statement is wrong. 
uh, I think it's a very basic question. It's a medium one, but yes, you can risk it because because you know the majority of the information, and they are a very very common information which we have. So answer has to be B. Now going by the next question, which which we have is was the question number sixty eight. National Air Quality Monitoring Program, very very important program. Okay, before I tell you anything about it, before I before we know any information, just read the name once. very carefully national air quality monitoring program the name is very obvious no we are talking about air quality monitoring now for look at the first statement this national air quality monitoring program administered by the central pollution control board nationwide program monitoring ambient obviously has to be correct because in india the apex body when whenever it comes to the pollution for pollution it is the central pollution control board which is the apex body so obviously it has to be under his domain very obvious question look at the second statement national air quality multi program undertaking to determine the status and trend of air quality asserting the compliance of national air quality standards and identifying the non ambient cities this has to be right because otherwise what is the purpose of monitoring program monitoring program will do this only na it will monitor it will check the air quality of the cities and whosoever city is not going to follow the standards like if if there is any city uh, in the last 5 years if the city is not able to get a good ranking or not able to follow the standards of air quality program that city is going to be counted as a non attainment city i mean this there is no rocket science with a, because these two are, has to be correct considering the program that we are referring to now the third is a bit tricky third statement is a bit tricky one because now it it is specifically asking you which particular of them are considered as pollutant in this particular program now sulfur dioxide we know it's a it's a very uh, high air uh, air uh, pollutant right we have the uh, oxides of nitrogen they are next they are like poison only and we know when it when we talk about the air quality we always talk about the particulate matter pm 10 pm 5 2.5 very obvious now the only problem you have to be taken care of here is the carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide a major air pollutant it is not air pollutant guys carbon dioxide because the, because uh, naturally also you have 0.3% of the carbon dioxide it is the fourth largest gas that we have can it be can it be a air pollution it is not air pollution carbon dioxide has a more problem with when it it is a greenhouse gas it does not have a problem with in terms of pollution guys so carbon dioxide should not be monitored as a pollution one because naturally also it, it occurs and something which is already there in nature cannot be a polluting element right so going by that that particular logic at least i can eliminate it but for that matter you you have to be very careful while you are re reading these statements so uh, even without knowing the information i can still solve this question with a bit of common sense it was it was a medium question but i would definitely attempt it because i know the basics i i can simply understand and make sense with with little li little bit of my presence of mind so answer in this case has to be b2 only that is the case if you want to talk more about the standards it is there in in your pdf you can simply read read them out co2 is not considered as a pollutant in this regard another question we have on central pollution control board which is the apex body for for monitoring regulating the pollution in our country so this central pollution control board was established under the environment protection act oh okay wait big stop why see it we now we know it is about the pollution control board and we know environment protection act is a very important act that we have but if there is anything to be specific with respect to pollution we also have acts in our country like we have the water uh, pollution control act 1974 we also have air pollution control act 1981 so when we have those dedicated acts for the purpose of controlling the pollution of course environment act is not going to be more suitable for pollution control board it can be i'm not denying it but of course if you if you if you just just try to go with your a bit of conscious you you will understand okay we already have the pollution acts why it would be uh, uh, environment protection act right so if if you go by that logic the first answer has the first statement needs to be wrong because central pollution board was actually established under the water pollution act 
it has got some powers from 81 also of course it works under the ministry of environment it it ha it works on the ministry of environment that is true and for that matter of course some of the provisions of environment production acts are also taken into consideration but when it terms but it is specifically ans asking you the establishment was done under which act that has to be water pollution act simple and there is no price for guessing the second statement very obvious statement it is the apex organization the topmost organization which is going to control the pollution air quality preventing control mitigation nationwide obviously what else would a central pollution control board would do so first being wrong second is correct i would say this is an easy one uh, you must attempt it there is absolutely no problem right answer has to be okay sorry sorry wait 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 uh, yeah it is it is asking you not correct no oh, this is this is something you have to be careful about it is asking you not correct so only one is not correct okay now be careful now sometimes we know the answer we have we solve the question but we are uh, we make this mistake of correct not correct okay now i i, I was about to make that mistake but i have just seen the correct non correct part so answer has to be a this is the one which is not correct okay sometimes it happens with us no we we uh, sometimes <laughs> make these kind of mistakes also now question number 70 for you guys so what what about the question number 70 here the question 70 consider the following statements uh, now this particular question was okay uh, which of the above can lead to disqualification okay the keyword is disqualification of a member of parliament under this particular act representation of the people act see in india the member of parliament uh, can be disqualified and there are many conditions for that some of the conditions are mentioned in this particular act some of the conditions are also which are outside this particular act okay now that is something you have to be care taking care of like for example mm -hmm. if you if i look at this question i i clearly know that the term the provision of office of profit is clearly not a part of this particular act i mean how and when a member of parliament can be disqualified the first two statements are absolutely correct because if there is any person in our in our country any member of parliament is convicted and sentenced to imprisonment for two years or more by default the membership of the parliament he or she loses very recently we have seen in the case of rahul gandhi when he was uh, when he, uh, when in a defamation case he was uh, he was sentenced two years uh, uh, you know and and there is one more condition to that now this is very very uh, you know you have to be careful about this statement because once you are in imprisonment for two years so whatever your sentence you first you have to complete your sentence once till till you complete your sentence you are disqualified and once you complete that even six years after that your sentence is complete you will still be not be able to uh, fight the elections it's a very very uh, very strict law that we have made now this particular provision is is mentioned in the representation of the people act also also uh, if anybody who gets convicted for promoting enmity between different people if somebody is doing that somebody is uh, doing the hate speech yes that person is also going to be disqualified under the act please be very careful this particular provision of hate speech it does not include i'm mentioning it broadly does not include the defamation thing okay rahul gandhi was was uh, given a sentence for defamation that is why supreme court has quashed that particular judgment i hope you got it right now the first two are there but look at the third one of course of course the third is a condition for disqualification i'm not den denying it office of profit is basically when you are holding when you are holding a government of uh, india office and at the same time you are also running something which is profitable to you or you are involved in some activity or some particular uh, uh, office which is going to give you the benefit uh, and you are misusing the power of your position and to make your own personal profit that is called office of profit so in that particular case you will be disqualified but this is not mentioned in the representation of the people act condition is there but this condition is outside this particular act so third is not within this particular act because it is specifically asking you disqualification under this particular rule so one and two are the correct one answer has to be two i know this is a bit difficult it was a tough one but but if you if you know this particular fact then you can risk it otherwise you you can skip 
if you have not heard because it is very specifically asking you to give the answer under one particular act. Okay, that is important guys. Look at this one. It is under article 102, the office of profit case and all. Uh, it, is, it is not in representation people act. Article 102 talks about the office of profit. And there are other conditions for the disqualification also. Other than office of profit under 102, a person can be disqualified if he is having unsound mind, undischarged insolvent, not a citizen of India or if he is disqualified under any law made by the parliament, then under 102, that person MP is going to be disqualified. That, that provisions are already there. Okay, question 71 was with respect to the Manipur Victim Compensation Scheme 2019. Let us say, let's assume that I have not read about it. I am not aware, I am not, uh, I have not, uh, I don't know the, the core concept of the scheme. Please read the options. This question can be solved by a common sense and an elimination method. Look, read the, uh, read the scheme once again. It is talking about victim compensation compensation scheme. So now we have the three options. The purpose of the scheme, number one, it is talking about, is it about uh, uh, appointing experts to facilitate functioning of the relief camp? Can relief camp be a part of compensation? It can be, but can it be the sole purpose or the main purpose? It cannot be the main purpose because we are specifically talking about the compensation. Is, is it about uh, issuing the disability certificate or issuing the certificate for the relief camp people doesn't sound very good to me. Compensation scheme, now third is more logical, more close to the scheme as the name says, providing fund for the compensation to the victims or dependents who suffered loss, injury and require rehabilitation, isn't it guys? This, this particular line, this particular option is actually going to give me the best hint what this compensation scheme session this compensation scheme can be about. So I will go with that gut feeling. Yes, the answer has to be C. I know it, this was a this was a difficult one, but if you if you apply the elimination technique, then you, it can easily be solved because there are no the options are very clear. Op, the question can be tough, but in this case, options are very very clear. They are not creating any confusion. Very clearly, it is said this scheme can be about what particular thing. So yes, attempt it. I would say this is an easy question because the options here are very very easy they do not have any problem well this was this was this uh, talking about this scheme a little bit more because manipur violence we have seen recently also that's why this scheme becomes important though it, it, it's a scheme of 2019 but still very very important okay that 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 makes sense about the uh, this thing so uh, th uh, this particular scheme has a base where a three member committee was uh, formed and that committee was under Justice Geeta Mittal and based on the recommendation that committee has recommended all these points of you know uh, if, uh, if the person has lost essential documents then they should be uh, given some relief uh, for the upgradation of victim compensation scheme and of course talking about appointment of domain experts to facilitate the functioning but with respect to the scheme the, the scheme was clearly talking about providing the funds giving the funds to the people who have lost people in that particular case. Question number 72 was Office of the Registrar General of India and he follows the criteria set by this particular committee. Okay, that is important. Okay, uh, okay, they could look at this question carefully. Uh, we have to figure the correct one. Office of Registrar General of India, fine. We know the Registrar General of India has to do something with the, with the, with preparing the uh, sensex of India and everything like that and works under the Home Ministry. Office of Registry General of India is about deciding whether a committee can be included in ST list or not. That we know. That we know. But the only problem and something that can trouble us is with respect to the name of the committee because this is something which is very absolute fact. I mean, I, I, cannot, I, I can't do any logic work here. Because there are so many committees and every committee has recommended with so many things. Now the first statement can trouble me a little bit. But look at the second one. If, if you at least agree that this there, there was some committee, let it be XYZ committee. But that particular committee, let, forget about the name, there was a committee. And talking about the uh, inclusion of ST people. Now, now look at the second statement is very obvious. 
Now, on what basis you are going to give representation to the ST people? What criteria you can think of that okay, this community should be given the status of scheduled tribe? What criteria could be there? Of course, it can be when you have those people are having very primitive traits, very underdeveloped status, very distinct culture they have, can be geographical isolation, very shyness in terms of contacting the other people and they are suffering from backwardness in every space. So, second looks very very obvious to me because these are the probably the main reasons why any community can be included in the ST list. So, second is definitely correct. The only problem I have is with the with the reference to the committee. Well, but in this particular case the committee name is correct. There is no problem. It, it was the local committee, local committee and you please try to remember it because even these days lot of news coming from coming uh, in this particular regard about adding uh, things to the ST list. Some people like recently Maiti are to be included some some of the uh, some of the people from Himachal they are also included in the in the ST list and there are there were a lot of protest also. So, this particular is a, is a situation where where you have lots of information coming with respect to uh, different different groups. Uh, you are they are being added or there are demands of the people to be added in the ST list. So, do take care of this kind of news, but when it comes to local committee 1965 yes it is about adding the people to the ST list and recommending the criteria. So, here both seems very correct. The only problem was with the committee, but yeah in this case at least I know the 90 percent of the information I can still take a risk. It was a tough one for people, but I would say please take a risk because you know rest of the uh, of the information can be the correct one. Here the answer has to be C. Sometimes you have to go with your heart. Sometimes you have to take a bit of risk. It is ok. Ok that is important. Ok. Oh, and yeah, the, there is a process. I, I want you to know the process. This is very interesting and you never know because given the kind of news that that, that is floating around with respect to ST list, you may be asked a question based on the process. How any community included into the ST list? Now, what happens? Now, this all process is recommended by the local committee only. So, what happens basically guys? So, whenever you have to include any tribe into the ST list, that proposal, that demand originally has to originate from the state. State or the UT government first has to recommend, ok we want to add this uh, community into the ST list. Well, that particular proposal from the state or the UT then it is sent to the union tribal ministry. Then union tribal ministry send that uh, uh, request to the registrar general of India. Registrar general of India when he approves that demand then it goes to the national commission for scheduled tribes. National Commission for Scheduled Tribe, then it is going to approve and, propo and, and uh, let that proposal go forward to the cabinet. Then cabinet has to recommend it, cabinet has to approve that particular demand and finally, from cabinet the request goes to the president office and he has the final power to issue notification ok that I am going to change article 341 and 342 which where we have the ST list and all the benefits included. So, the whole process is important. You never know you may be asked about the process also. So, be a bit careful about it. Question number 73 was with respect to the birth registration of birth death amendment 2023. This is a very interesting question for many people you may think it is a it is a tough one, but let me give you a very interesting way of solving this question. Ok, read the uh, uh, this is registration of the birth and death amendment act 2023. Now, birth and death is not something new that is happening mm. in our country right. I mean this birth and death is something which was happening and the registration is being done for so many years. What possible this amendment could do? What new what new we can do in terms of birth and death? certification right. Look first statement says introduces the concept of digital births I mean this is the this is the only thing we can do right because original act was passed in 1969 I know this much it's uh, it was it was in 1960 1969 that the act was there, but now only thing that I can add recently is about digitalizing the whole process. So, yes first statement looks correct to me. The second says it proposes linking Aadhaar because nowadays every every scheme is going to be linked by Aadhaar no. Every scheme is talking about linking Aadhaar with almost everything. 
So yeah, this also looks correct to me. The third statement says it establishes a centralized database to manage the birth and death records uh, and that is to be done for the sake of efficient service delivery and maintaining records and information. Yeah, I mean this is the obvious things, no? Very simple answer, very simple options. You should take this kind of risk. I mean this is a logical risk. I'm not asking you to go blindly with the risk but look what else has to be there in the recent birth and date amendment. I would say risk it because, because the options are very simple and a little bit of common sense you can solve it. Now these are the questions which will decide your if you are clearing the UPSC prelim cutoff or not because many people will leave it because they will think oh we have not read about this act so we can't solve it. No, it's not like that. It is something you can solve okay and yeah one more information birth and death. Uh, 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 subject is is falling under the concurrent list. I mean, they can be separate MCQ on that also. Birth and death is a is a concurrent list where state and the parliament both can make the laws. Rest of the options are very obvious. I mean, you can simply uh, figure out and solve them. Now, the next question is about the Tiger Reserves of India. Now, Tiger Reserve, I am recommending you guys. This is a very important topic. Tiger Reserve as well as the Elephant Reserves. So, I recommend you. To please be very careful about especially those tiger reserves and elephants which were in the news in the last one year and try it and, and, and if there is any new tiger reserve, any new elephant reserve, please do take care of that also because ti project tiger, project elephant both are flagship programs of the government of India. So every year there is a possibility of asking questions from these two particular areas, right? Important. Now it now look at the look at the question. This is a very fact based question. No scope of guessing. It says the Dampa Tiger Reserve of Mizoram is having 30% population. Jim Corbett has the highest population that we have. Okay, first I should give you a bit of information. See, guys, every tiger reserve in India not necessarily have good amount of tiger population. Unfortunately, there are some tiger reserves of India right now with the zero tiger population. For example, the Sahyadri Tiger Reserves in Maharashtra, Satkosia in, in Odisha, the Kaval in Telangana, Dampa which was in the question in Mizoram and the Kamlang that we have in Arunachal. Now here there is absolutely no tiger population. You, in terms of Jim Corbett Park is something that is very important uh, tiger reserve for us because in India Jim Corbett which is in, which is in Uttarakhand, Jim Corbett National Park has the highest tiger population that we have in India. Followed by Bandipur in Karnataka, Nagarhul in Karnataka, Bandavgarh in MP and Dudwa in UP. At least try it. I want you guys to remember these five names and also try to practice them on the map. He, these are the five uh, tiger reserves having the highest population of tigers in India. So if you look at the question again, so first statement you will say okay this actually is absolutely incorrect. Dampa Tiger Reserve has uh, uh, not 30, 0 percent, absolutely no tiger at this moment. So yes. Dampa, first statement looks wrong, second is correct, Jim Corbett has the highest one followed by the other things that I told you. Now this is a medium kind of question, I am not saying this is a tough one, I mean Jim Corbett is something that you can think of but be very careful, recently only the Jim Corbett has become the highest uh, tiger population, before that it was the Bandavgad of Karnataka. Now recently Jim Corbett has registered more tiger population into that. So I think this is a, a medium one but uh, if you have no idea. If this is a very fact based question then you should skip it, don't, don't take risk unnecessary. Like I am sure many of you would not have guessed this one. You would not, you, I am sure we, we can't guess this, the some tiger reserves are having zero population also. So it's a tough one, I, I would recommend you to skip it. If you are not able to understand the statements well then don't take any non-serious risk. Question number 75 was about the nuclear fission, probably this is a very very basic concept of science. This is something we have read throughout our life. Talking about the nuclear fission reaction. Okay. Now which statement is correct? Now nuclear fission, look at the first statement. I do not even need to tell you any information on that. Look at the, read the first statement. Nuclear fission is a reaction where two or more nuclei they combine. Is it like that? We have read about the nuclear fission. Fission is all the chain reaction that we have. No, The chain reaction the one breaks into two the 2 breaks into 4 and the 4 breaks into 16 and so that. So nuclear fission is the breaking of the nuclei. 
when two or more nuclei when they combine to form a bigger one that is not fission that is called nuclear fusion reaction the science behind development of the hydrogen bomb that we have no the two small small hydrogen nuclei they combine to form a helium that is the nuclear fusion reaction in stars you have the nuclear fusion the nuclear technology that we have is based on nuclear fission the nuclear bomb nuclear reactor so first is absolutely correct incorrect and this is a very very basic thing and i do not think anybody can make this blunder fission is about breaking fusion is about combining second third very obvious statement radioact it is only the radioactive isotopes which are used because radioactive isotopes are the most unstable elements and only their 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 nucleus is radioactive and that is that is the that is the nucleus that is going to split away fast so radio radioactive elements and uh, uranium 235 is the most commonly nuclear fuel that we have used uh, 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 along with the u35 it is also the plutonium even plutonium 239 is also very fissile and that plutonium 235 is actually the base of india's nuclear program no we have uh, in the last video i told you about the three uh, stages of india's nuclear program so here i think a very very easy question attempt do attempt it and the answer has to be b because first is wrong i mean don't don't uh, overthink on these questions they are very obvious questions the next question is with respect to the president rule now this question is a bit difficult why i am talking about because it's a fact based question and something which is there obviously not something that you can guess about question number 76 president rule before i tell you something you need to have a basic about idea about the president rule that we have in india uh, you have to go to the article 356 356 in india is talking about the it is talking about the president rule that we have okay now if i talk about the president rule if i have to talk about the president rule article 356 what exactly the provision says now in india there are uh, three very important articles for the emergency provision article 352 for national emergency 356 president rule and article 360 is with respect to the financial emergency in india now if you recommend to the 356 article there it is clearly mentioned that if any if there is any case of the failure of the constitutional machinery in the state in that particular situation the president if president thinks that okay now this particular state cannot be run with respect to the provisions of the constitution and there is complete failure of the constitutional machinery the president can act it he can act based on the report which he, which he receives from the governor sometime governor has to uh, send a report and uh, tells the govern uh, tells the president the state is in bad state or sometimes even even if uh, president not necessarily only after the uh, uh, getting a report from the governor if president himself also think that there is a situation where the normal governance cannot be taken care by then in that particular case if he satisfied the situation is emergency situation that president can do certain things president can invoke article 356 in that article 356 he can assume to himself all or some of the functions of the government right he can declare that the power of legislature of the state shall be exercisable by the parliament or he can make incidental consequential provisions as as to appear president to be necessary to desiring giving effect to the objects of the proclamation and by for that matter he can suspend the whole or some part of the constitution with respect to that particular state so that these are the special powers that we have uh, with respect to the uh, with respect to the president now there was a time when in india there was a, there was a there was a, a kind of political instability and india had witness lots and lots of states you know uh, going into the president rule for longer times and even for many number of times now considering that problem where president rule was considered as a quick fix method where the center wants to dominate over the state to restrict those kind of the misuse of the president rule it was a landmark sr bomai case where the supreme court has clearly ended the arbitrary dismissal of the state governments under the article 356 because lots of misuse was happening with respect to the president rule so this case becomes very very important in terms of president rule in india 
and it was the sr bombay case only which has which has categorically said and ruled if there is any confusion with respect to the state government only the floor test of the assembly is the best way to decide if the government has a majority or not and and the majority and the state government's future is not going to be decided by the subjective opinion of the governor there has to be a floor test and the very recent example we have seen in the bihar very recently we have seen the bihar floor test which was there i hope you got this got this meaning this this case is very important guys sr bombay case is a landmark judgment in terms of this and this particular case also in in this in the same case only supreme court ruled that the power of the president to dismiss a state government is not absolute that is also subjected to some restrictions so these are the three or four landmark things which were there in the case you can read about them in detail now if if you look at the question the question has problem with the second statement it is the minivra mill case that uh, that president rule arbitrariness was ended no it is the sr bomai case not the minivra minivra mill case has relation to the balancing of fundamental rights and dpsps the fundamental right and dpsps are the two wheels of a uh, two uh, wheels of the same cart the, the the balance the foundation the bedrock of uh, of the entire constitution is based on these two equal uh, importance was given to fundamental right and, and the dpsps minerva mill case does not have to do anything with the president rule guys so clearly this statement is wrong if i know this much if i know this much look i can simply eliminate the statements and by default i'll get the right answer as the answer c right so this question i would say it's a medium one but something that you can attempt because minerva mill case golaknath case uh, uh, keshavanand bharti case these these are very landmark judgments and as a student of the upsc and polity you must be aware of these landmark judgments like we have the sr bombay case we have the we have the uh, nagarjun committee then you have the uh, uh, other important cases that we have right and uh, uh, indra indra sahani case these are landmark cases you should be aware of Question seventy seven is with respect to the collegium system. I am very sure that you people must have heard of the collegium system. It is in news very much. Even recently, it was in news. There, there, there is a tussle between the central government and the judiciary with respect to how the judges of Supreme Court and the High Court are going to be appointed and transferred. Right now, collegium system is in practice, and. the judges of supreme court and high court are appointed and transferred by that collegium system but please understand the collegium system is not formed by the act of the parliament if that would be the case clearly there should not be any disagreement between judiciary and the central government so now the now actually the central government wants to pass a bill to to uh, pass a bill with respect to how up, uh, the uh, the judges are going to be up, appointed and transferred and right now the supreme court has the autonomy in that the supreme court of india follows the collegium system and collegium system has, is something which has evolved over a, a, over a period of time it is not by the act of the parliament you must have heard uh, uh, the very interesting cases called the judges cases in india it was it was between 1990s and 2000 between those particular 10 years there were three judges cases judges uh, first judge case second judge case and the third judges case the three important landmark judgments given by supreme court in this particular regard and it was a second judges case where this collegium system was actually shaped and further consolidated by the third judges case okay so collegium system is not rooted in constitution it is not by any act of parliament it is surely based on the judgments uh, uh, that were given by the supreme court of india between 1990s and 2000 there, there were three judges cases very interesting and important one and collegium right now is something which is all talking about now collegium system is actually headed by the chief justice of india and as per the as per the present provisions every collegium is going to have five member one cgi and four other senior most judges are going to be there the recommendations of these collegiums uh, uh, can be of two types 
I mean this collegium decide uh, with respect to the uh, high court judges, they also respect, uh, uh, decide with respect to the supreme court judges. Now when, when the collegium is talking about the high court, actually it is a three member commission with one CGI plus two other senior most judges. When they are talking about the supreme court judges, then it becomes four where CGI has to be accompanied by four senior most judges. These are the two cases. Now, now how can you guess this because see every important decision of the Supreme Court is something where we have five or more judges bench. It is a, it's a standard practice where five or more judges are taken into account when you are deciding something very landmark. Okay? Now very recent one that we have seen in case of electoral bonds, it was a five judge bench. right? So, in, there is a practice that if there is anything of very much importance, it has to be minimum 5 can go with 7 or 9 judges bent which is rare, but 5 or 7 judges are very common. And the third judges case 1998 I told you it talks about uh, uh, the consultation process, uh, uh, you know how, how the consultation is to be done like the 5 judges, the, the 5 members of collegium even if 2 judges do not agree the recommendations would not be uh, forwarded to the government. So, the third case specifically talks about how the collegium function is going to agree on uh, the names of appointing or transferring the judges. So, second and third case judges case is, is important with respect to the uh, collegium system. So, first statement clearly this is wrong, it is based on the judges, three judges cases. The second says is absolutely correct, the CGI followed by the four judges. The third case specifically talking about uh, and, and yeah one more thing, the uh, recommendations are not binding on the government that is something you have to be taken care of, Okay, that is important guys. So in this case, uh, no it, they are binding, so whatever they are not binding is wrong, so whatever they say has to be final, the government does not have any say in that, you know? that is the problem that the two are facing. And which statement is not correct? So yeah, this is also not correct. This this uh, this particular is also not correct, right? So this is wrong. So I would say uh, this particular question was a bit tough for few people, but uh, I think you should you should skip it in case you have absolutely no idea. But collegium is something I would say you know you can you can simply ask uh, because uh, it's something you should prepare because it's a very important question that we have. Question number 78 was with respect to the reservation of the seats in the local bodies in India. Now look, please look at the question very carefully. The question is about reserving the seats of people in the local body. Now please be very careful whenever it comes to the local body, I am talking about the panchayat, I am talking about the panchayat, talking about the municipalities. Okay. Now in India, please be very careful. Uh, in Indian constitution, when it comes to reservation of the people of seats for, lo lo uh, for the local bodies, yes we have provided reservation for SCs, we have given reservation for STs, but not for the back OBCs. Women are being provided as one third reservation without any doubt. So please remember the original provisions of the reservation because OBCs emerged later on guys. The original provisions of the reservation was only for SC, ST and women. OBC actually arrived later on and, and now you know and that is the reason in 2018 only we have got a national commission on OBCs. Very recently we have got in article 338b and that is why OBCs are not by default uh, uh, included in the Lok Sabha uh, uh, in, in the local bodies reservation process. Right? So first is not correct. If I know this much, if I know this much I can simply eliminate look at the options. Now I only am left with the option B because this much I can guess because OBCs were emerged later. So clearly are not included in the in the OBC and please look at the, the uh, percentage. How would you reserve seats for the OBC when OBCs in India have 52 percent population you see? 52 percent population of India is OBC. You cannot include OBC otherwise there is no pointing of giving reservation. Okay, Go by that logic. SCST is still less. We have approximately 7.5 percent, 7.5 percent population of the scheduled tribes. We have approximately 15 percent uh, for the scheduled caste. That makes sense. OBC 52 percent. We can't reserve. Otherwise, there is no point of reserving the uh, uh, seats, right? So first, you exclude. You will get the answer as B two and three. That is correct. Second, third are obvious, very, very uh, simple questions. Simply, you can say that they, they, those statements are correct. So I would say this is a very easy one, attempt it. 
uh, in constitution yes there is reservation for the chairperson position see of course if you are reserving the seats of course the women sc st can also be reserving the seats for the chairperson this is very obvious right uh, and yeah parliament has uh, given the authority to ex ex extend the provisions of part 9 uh, to the panchayat for the fifth schedule and sixth schedule also but remember every provision of the pisa act doesn't does not apply automatically in the last video i told you that they don't get applied automatically there needs to be uh, some safeguards from the governor because ultimately fifth schedule areas and sixth schedule areas are about protecting the tribal people so you have to be a bit careful with that now question number 79 i think it's a, it's a very simple question very uh, important because we are talking about pulses um uh, in india yes madhya pradesh is the largest producer of the pulses that is correct this is a very fact based information india is largest consumer yes india is consumer producer importer india uh, let, let me share you some information here that will make the things easy for you look at look at the cases of pulses in india it is the madhya pradesh largest producer followed by uh, maharashtra rajasthan up and karnataka india largest producer because we are producing 25% of the global production of pulses we are largest consumer also 27% of the pulses are consumed in india and that's why that is why you see our production is still less than than the consumption that's why we have to import also so india becomes importer also of the pulses because our consumption is more with whatever maximum we are producing so we are also importing the pulses pulses can be grown in all the three seasons kharif rabi and zaid but 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 the pulses that are grown in the rabi pulses in the rabi season rabi season which season which starts in october goes till the march in in the same season when we grow our wheat kharif is something which which is uh, synonymous to the monsoons in india starting in june july uh, june july season and goes up to september that is your kharif season where we cultivate the rice of india so the rabi pulses contribute 60% so you have major uh pulses major pulses grow in winter guys in india the major uh, pulses grow in the winter season the rabi season that we have okay now if you look at this i think the statements are very obvious for you first and second being correct the third statement definitely is wrong because it says the kharif pulses contribute the majority no it is the rabi pulses contributing 60% of the total production so clearly not answer has to be b Uh, i would say this is a medium one and i am sure you know some of the answers so you can still risk this question without any problem you just have to be bit more careful uh, don't end up going for more negative marking last question is with respect to the basmati rice guys now the question of the basmati rice again be careful that the that you have to figure out which statement is not correct now this is something you have to be careful correct or not correct question about the basmati now basmati is a is a name is a brand name that we have in india and you know the basmati rice in india has a gi tag also now do not get confused that basmati is, is some specific variety basmati is a brand name that we give to the rice having some specific qualities that we have in india and as as the food safety standard authority of india fssai has specified some standards for the basmati rice like for example which particular rice is to be called as basmati the standards include the natural fragrance that particular rice has to be free from artificial coloring should be free from artificial polishing should not be having any artificial fragrance and and whosoever which whichever variety of the rice qualifies the quality parameters by fssai like for example uh, considering the size of the grains because they are long long size grains okay and uh, they they must be along there 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 is some specific elongation ratio for cooking uh, what maximum limit of the moisture and all these are there so based on that the basmati is the brand name that we give to the rice there are many basmati varieties that that we have in india there are more than 34 types of uh, basmati rice varieties that we have universally they are known for their long grain size okay and where in india these kind of varieties are produced in india we have jammu kashmir himachal punjab haryana delhi uttarakhand western up you see basmati is majorly restricted to the northern belt of india to the northern states of india basmati is not very much popular in the southern parts of india so this information is important for you also please be careful the word the term basmati is not exclusively for the rice that we grow in india 
basmati term is also used for the rice that 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 people grow in pakistan it is shared by both countries the name basmati is for both india and pakistan rice varieties india accounts for 2/3 almost 66% of the global supply of the basmati is done by india alone there are more than 34 varieties of the basmati that we have with our major export destinations being saudi arabia iran iraq uae and all the gulf countries yemen republic and all because in gulf it is indian variety of basmati that that is the most famous now please look at the statements that we have the first statement is saying the basmati cultivated in andhra and bengal no we have seen basmati belongs to the northern belt of india basmati term belonging only for the rice in india no we also have the basmati for pakistan and india is not accounting for 80% of the supply it is 66% two third is what we have i mean this was a this was a this was a medium question uh, you can risk it but if you are not good with the because see there are confusing part also i mean uh, this particular term this particular many people do not have this information that that uh, basmati also has a name in pakistan so probably that that is uh, you know a bit risky so i would say uh, my recommendation for many people if it is tough please skip it do not uh, uh, unnecessary because these in, in this particular case the uh, the options are tricky if you see because that is true in pakistan in uh, 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 west bengal and andhra also we have lot of rice cultivation uh, third is something which is a bit more exaggeration you can simply see india is also not producing that much that we are supplying 80% is bit exaggeration uh, but yeah the options are confusing i would say skip it because looks very easy but they are actually tough questions so i hope you have enjoyed this particular uh, video guys and you have learned a lot this was uh, part number 4 of our discussion last 20 questions are left i'll see you guys in the part number 5 soon best wishes from my side uh, for your upcoming exam keep smiling keep learning keep enjoying these videos and if you have still not subscribed to the youtube channel do it please and if you have still not subscribed to our test series because there are quality questions in that and the test series link is given in the description below so please do check that out it is always better to practice it is not just listening to the questions you will always be having the help only if you are able to practice them that my only advice to people going for the upsc exam is please practice practice and practice as many mcqs as you can this is ashish malik signing off take care jai hind jai bharat